We are live right now on YouTube. So good morning, Dr. Seifert. How are you? It's a real, real honor to be with you. Oh, thank you very much, Carlos. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Something that people for, forget is that cancer right now is the second leading cause of death all over the world. And uh, it doesn't respect social class, uh, gender, uh, race, anything, country, anything. For how many years have you been studying cancer and what has been the increase of the rate of cancer that you've seen all over the years that you've been studying cancer? Actively investigating, well, well let's put it this way, probably 45 years. Um, initially, uh, the research was predominantly uh, asking uh, questions about biochemistry and and, and uh, lipid biochemistry on cancer cells. It wasn't really, it wasn't really focused on developing a, a treatment protocol. Uh, when when I when I first looked into cancer, like er, like everyone else, we thought it was a genetic disease, and um, many of us were looking at different biomarkers and things like this. It wasn't until uh, ninth, uh, about two thousand, the year two thousand, that. Uh, we started to consider uh, underlying causes of cancer and the actual mechanism by which tumor dysregulated cell growth was was occurring. And uh, that's when we linked up with what uh, Otto Warburg, uh, the German uh, uh, chemist, had had long long ago said that this is a uh, a disease of energy metabolism. And our own research uh, over these decades uh, has strongly supported, uh, what Otto Warburg had originally described, and um, we br we we're we're in the process of bringing the field of cancer back to its where it should have rightfully been, which is that this is a metabolic disorder, and we have strong evidence supporting what Warburg said, and not only that, we have new evidence that Warburg did not know about that even more strongly supports the view that cancer is a metabolic disease. Once you once you realize that, then the strategy uh, for managing the disease becomes far more different and less toxic than than what we are currently doing. So yeah, so we've been investigating all aspects of both the initiation, the origin, the management, and also the aspects of prevention. Because once you know the new theory that drives the the, the research and actually underlies what the disease is, then then there's going to be a, an enormous paradigm change. And death uh, from cancer will be significantly reduced uh, once once the field uh, uh, understands what 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 it really is. I've been physicians saying that uh, the problem is that cancer hasn't been growing at all; that it's just being more diagnosed. That we have more tools for for early diagnosis today, which is true. There are, there are tools for making an early diagnosis, but but we haven't seeing cancers in kids is like we do now. We haven't seen cancers in, in adolescents and, or in young adults as we see today. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's an important point. I, I think the, the uh, accumulation of toxins in the environment, the types of foods that we're eating, uh, you know, all of these things impact. There's not one single cause of cancer. As a matter of fact, I, I went through and identified all of the the, what we call uh, risk factors, okay? Um, there are many, many risk factors, um, mostly in the environment, diet, lifestyle issues, uh, rare inherited mutations. Uh, all, all of the risk factors that we have identified all in, impact one way or another on the function of the mitochondrion in the cytoplasm of the cell to generate energy metabolism. So whatever the risk factors happen to be, it's a chronic problem of energy metabolism. And, and I think that the environments uh, all around the world are becoming more contaminated with different things. It, so you have contaminants and you have diet and lifestyle issues, you have lack of exercise issues, you have all these different issues uh, all impacting uh, on different people, different ages um, and different uh, cell populations, leading to what we now know is a as you've already indicated, Carlos, it's a second leading cause of death. And in China, it already has surpassed heart disease as, as the leading cause of death. 
Uh, when I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago, uh, I was told that we in China there's 8,100 people dying uh, each day uh, from from cancer. In the United States, it's over almost 1,700 people a day. It's six. 1,680 people a day dying from cancer in the United States. And, and I think, I think we, we have to look at, um, at, at the death. We, we have to look at numbers of people dying because that ultimately tells you uh, how we are doing in the war on cancer. How many people are dying from this disease? And the answer is it's increasing. It's not decreasing. It's increasing. Yes, there are more cases, and that might relate back to your question. Maybe we are diagnosing a lot more cancers. That's true. That's amazing. It's fascinating how you how you make it so easy to understand. You you were saying that you've pointed out uh, several risk factors that they all merge into the same ultimate condition, which is a lack of energy and mitochondrial production. Could you tell us which are those risk factors that you might that people are maybe don't know that, that uh, in order to have a higher risk of of getting cancer? Well, I think uh, right now one of the biggest uh, risk factors is obesity. Obesity is linked to type two diabetes. O obesity is linked to systemic inflammation. Um, systemic inflammation, chronic systemic inflammation, uh, can damage energy metabolism in a certain population of cells in a certain organ. It can vary from one person uh, to another. But um, obesity has now replaced smoking as one of the top uh, risk factors uh, for cancer. So you have that, uh, um, you, you have chronic inflammation, intermittent hypoxia, uh, chemical carcinogens, exposure to chemical carcinogens, radiation, uh, viral infections, uh, uh, papillomavirus, hepatitis viruses, these all damage mitochondria. And, and, and at the same time, you have several overlaps, uh, aging populations overlapping with obesity, with chronic inflammation, with hypoxia. All of these, all of these uh, provocative uh, secondary, uh, what we call secondary risk factors can impact uh, any one of which or together can increase the risk uh, of cancer. So you have to be um, aware of, 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 of the risk factors. And then once you know that all of these risk factors in some way or another compromise uh, ability of the, uh, of the cell to generate energy through respiration, breathing oxygen, essentially. When you say this risk factors go and interfere with the mitochondria so that people remember that the mitochondria is that part inside the cell when we one of the functions, because it's not the only one, where we produce energy when we take oxygen and glucose to produce energy in most of the most of the cases, or the the easiest way for the cell to produce energy, then the cell starts having a lack of of uh, energy production or a lack of a, of the normal function of the mitochondria. How does it work? Those all those risk factors go into the same pathway. And, and at the end, they, they produce exactly the same thing? The, um, energetically, they're very similar. Uh, obviously, if, that, if, that risk, if those combinations or singular risk factor would, do, would, would uh, damage mitochondria in a liver cell or a colon cell or a lung cell, you would get dysregulated growth from the cells uh, of those tissues. If it were to happen in the glial population of the brain, you would get a dysregulated growth of the glial cells. Under the microscope, uh, they would look different from each other uh, because one is from the brain, one is from the lung, one is from the colon, one would be from the bladder. But if you look at them biochemically, they're all very, very similar to each other in that they're all struggling to get energy from uh, sources other than oxygen. So they, um, they ferment, they use, a, uh, they use the ancient pathway of fermentation. This is energy without oxygen. And, and how, do, how do we know that? Because we, Warburg and others, uh, we were able to take cancer cells and grow them in hypoxia without oxygen. Uh, that's one of the unique things about cancer cells. They all can grow in the absence of oxygen. Not, none of us can, can live in the absence of oxygen. And the best way to, to demonstrate that is we know the, the drug cyanide. And we know that people that would take cyanide to commit suicide die very, very quickly. 
because they shut down the energy, oxidative energy metabolism in all cells of the body, and the person dies real quick. Uh, you can pour cyanide on a tumor cell. It doesn't die at all. So uh, um, it lives. It can live in cyanide. It can live without oxygen. And this cuts across all the different kinds of tumors. We all know brain tumors, colon tumors, bladder tumors, breast tumors. They all can live in cyanide and without oxygen. In this case, obviously, and it's been part of your work, you suggest that people start on a ketogenic diet or to start being in, in a ketogenic state, although you can you can meet a ketogenic state by fasting or by exercising and fasting without being on a ketogenic diet. Um, my question is, is there, I mean, if, 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 I, if I'm on a ketogenic diet, you say that when the body is on ketones or in a ketogenic diet or in a ketogenic state by fasting, that's a state in which uh, the tumor cells are not going to find any way of energy from glucose or from glutamine so the first thing would be for that person even either to if they're going to be in a ketogenic state or in ketosis by fasting or, or training or in a ketogenic diet to avoid completely glutamine they have to avoid completely glutamine is there a way into which or or try to eat low glutamine proteins or how, how do they Yeah, yeah, glutamine is, is the most abundant amino acid in our body, um, it, the highest amino acid in the blood. Um, it's absolutely essential for the function of our immune system, the gut, the urea cycle. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute uh, critical um, amino acid. Um, George Cahill, who ran the diabetes, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, uh, fasted folks for um, more than uh, two weeks, two to three weeks, And then you began to see not only the glucose go way down and ketones go up, but the glutamine started to go down. But, you know, um, we need drugs and, and um, we, we, we have drugs that work really, really well uh, to target glutamine. Um, they have been used in the past, but like any tool, uh, you really need to know how to use the tool that you have. If you try to target glutamine with a drug by itself, Uh, you're not going to get the uh, outcome uh, for several reasons. You need to target glucose and glutamine together. You can't target one. Uh, actually, targeting glucose works a hell of a lot better than by itself than targeting glutamine by itself. But if you target both together, you get the real the massive benefit uh, from, from the shutting down all the energy metabolism in the cancer cell, the majority of energy metabolism in the cancer cell. The issue, of course, with glutamine targeting, you, you, have to, you have to appreciate the importance of glutamine for the gut and the immune system and uh, other systems. So that's why we developed the press pulse metabolic therapy where we press glucose down heavy. Body doesn't need glucose. We can switch to ketones. Uh, we can replace glucose with ketones. Glutamine is an essential for uh, a lot of things. So we can't hit glutamine too hard for too long. So what we do is we take drugs and we use them at a lower dosage and they really, really work well when the body is in nutritional ketosis. So that's why we developed the glucose ketone index calculator to allow cancer patients to know, regardless of what they eat, ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, Mediterranean diet, vegan diet, pescatarian diet, doesn't make any difference. If you can get your glucose down and your ketones up, Then you can strategically use glutamine inhibitors, low doses, uh, dosage timing and scheduling variations to degrade slowly uh, the tumor without, without causing any collateral damage or secondary toxicity. Dr. Seafried, thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for your work. Your work has been inspiring thousands of people, th thousands of physicians such as myself. I loved your book when, when I read it and I've, I've loved every single one of your papers which I've tried to, to read them all and, and please continue with your work. And if there is anything, anything at all. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos. Okay. Nice being here. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye.